This is a power bank. You can charge your phone a couple of times, it's pretty handy. But this is a real power bank that I designed and 3D printed myself and today I'm going to show you exactly how I did it. I think that projects where you design and make your own stuff are the most satisfying and I've now got a power bank to take away camping like nothing else in the world. Let's go through how this project came about, some of the problems I had to solve along the way and also give an update on the upcoming Bamboo Lab X1 3D printer. This I'm sure you know is a power bank and a pretty good one too. It's got a 5 volt USB outlet for charging your phone or other device, a charging input and a button on the side. Pretty simple and ultimately quite effective. Previously I made a video showing that the inside of power banks contain 18650 rechargeable lithium ions. These are generally larger and more energy dense than alkaline batteries that you might be accustomed to. And in that video I used harvested secondhand cells to create a custom 24 volt battery to power a 3D printer. The result is a completely portable 3D printer but building this custom battery did require a lot of work and specialist tools such as this spot welder. This is still going strong, but there are other ways to build custom batteries and some of them are a lot more straightforward. Here's the cells we've discussed thus far and here's what I'll be using for this project. This is a Headway 38120 lithium iron phosphate cell. Firstly, the cell gets its name like an 18650 based on its exterior dimensions being 38 millimeters in diameter and 120 millimeters long. The capacity is 10 amp hours and each cell can discharge at a stupendous 100 amps. The chemistry, unlike an 18650 which is lithium ion, is lithium iron phosphate. The nominal voltage for one of these cells is 3.2 volts, which means four of them in series will produce a battery with a voltage of 12.8, a nice match for what's found in vehicles. Lithium iron phosphate batteries are considered safer than other rechargeable lithium cells, meaning your project is less likely to go up in smoke if something goes wrong. So user friendly, but what really sets them apart are these screw terminals built into each end. They have an M6 thread, which means that connecting cells together to form a battery requires no spot welder for a reliable strong connection. All you need to build your battery are some plastic spaces that normally come with the cells, and some metal strips with 6mm holes that line up with the cell terminals. What I'm using here just happens to be custom machined copper strips, a very tidy solution but certainly not the only option. Off the shelf bus bars are inexpensive and you can always just buy some metal strap and drill the holes yourself. So a user friendly rechargeable cell, time to turn it into a power bank. I actually got these last year and they've been sitting around waiting for a project ever since. Now I'm lucky enough to live in the beautiful Blue Mountains. Warmer weather is on the way and I'd like to do some camping. So my first design choice when building a power bank was to set it up to supply 12 volts instead of just 5 volts. And that's so it could power more than just my phone. Like 18650s, these cells can be combined in both series and parallel to achieve the desired performance. My battery was configured as 4S2P. My eight cells are grouped into pairs with those pairs connected in parallel and then the four pairs go in series to add up to 12.8 volts. It sounds complicated but you can pick up the battery and follow the path. To offer twin phone charging I've got these USB output buck converters. They can take anywhere between 6 to 26 volts input and output 5 volts for charging phones. They also have this handy display on top that tell us their input voltage. A no-brainer was to include this socket 12 volt output, commonly used for automotive applications. And finally, an Anderson plug, which are commonly used for solar panel chargers, campers and caravans. This particular connector can supply 50 amps, is polarized and has a rigid plastic body with mounting holes ideal for my application. The final component is this, a BMS or battery management system. This one being from Dali, a Chinese company who sells on AliExpress. And when you buy these, you have to match them to your type of cell, as well as your battery configuration. This one suits the chemistry of the headways and my configuration of four cells in series for an output of 12 volts. A BMS offers several advantages. 
The main one being they can cut off the battery input or output in dangerous conditions. That prevents you from overcharging, over discharging, drawing too much current and even from short circuits. And when you do charge the battery, it will balance each set of cells. Just like your RC battery charger does by using the balance plug going to the LiPo. The instructions for these BMSs are pretty generic, but the diagram is simple enough. Basically, the BMS goes in line for the negative lead, and then the balance plug has a negative lead and a positive lead for each set of series cells. After deciding on a mounting position, where I could be sure that all the existing leads reached, I got to work cutting and then crimping. And again, these headway cells meant the ring terminals were very convenient to attach, no soldering required. Before connecting the balance plug, it's important to make sure that you have everything wired in the correct order. Using the black lead as ground, each red lead should then increase in voltage. So for me, that's 3 volts, 6 volts, 9 volts, and finally 12 volts. With this verified, I was good to go. With the BMS connected as per the wiring diagram, I could finally verify that everything was working by using a multimeter to test the output voltage. Again, no problems. So then I could move on to adding the other connections. During this process, I discovered that my largest crimping tool had too much flex and wasn't really up to the job. So I replaced it with this extra heavy duty item, which gave a very reliable result and looked tidy too once some heat shrink was added. This looks like a bit of a mess, but in terms of the electric connections, it's functionally finished. I've added a switch for the USB outputs. They run in parallel and the display will tell me the current voltage of the battery. I also added a switch to the 12 volt socket and it's got a nice rubber cap to keep water out. The Anderson plug is in place and the BMS is strapped to the other side. Therefore, it was time to move on to designing the 3D printed casing. I designed this as I went and I split it into two parts. The first being an inner skeleton that would hold all of the cells, the BMS and all of the connectors on top. Some of the packaging is pretty tight. For instance, the two USB outputs stack on top of each other. And then I've got these little spaces in between to support them with of course a cutout on the top so you can see the display from the outside. And even though at this stage I hadn't designed the exterior, I was trying to make the design as flexible as possible with these hex cutouts to trap nuts with these situated all around the design facing different directions. To make sure the BMS would fit, I used a combination of dimensions from their website as well as my own measurements and I modeled up a simplified version including where the cables exited so I could make sure I had clearance. The BMS fit perfectly but I did make another mistake with the early frame design. Increasing the spacing between the cells from 40mm to 42 but of course then my old terminals no longer matched so to avoid machining all of the terminals again I reprinted the plastic cell brackets. From here things were a lot smoother and I was successfully able to mount all of the components to the subframe and now that they had their final positions I was able to shorten and re-terminate some of the wiring too. Overall it's a bulky design but at least now there's some proper direction. And that means I could keep designing and here is what I ended up with. It's probably best to explain how this works by creating a section view and looking inside. On the top as well as on the bottom we have caps that cover the ports as well as the BMS but we do leave the BMS heatsink exposed to help cooling. On the sides we have two symmetrical pieces that internally give a little bit of room for the raised battery terminals and on the outside of these I added a flat knurling effect from some simple extruded cuts. We then have a printed piece which slides over all of this and then a carbon fiber plate to go over the top of that. Finally a bore on each of the end plates for a carbon fiber rod to go across and act as a handle. Most of this is 3D printed and I thought it would be good to use the Bamboo Lab X1 so we can see what's been updated as they move towards production shipping. There's actually been quite a lot of development on this machine since I featured it in my Kickstarter video. Some of the changes have been completely expected, such as several iterations of firmware, adding features and squashing bugs. The slicer, Bamboo Studio, has been released open source, and the Bamboo Lab Wiki, used instead of a manual, is well underway and I've linked both of these in the description for you to browse. There's also been hardware revisions, with Bamboo Lab sending me a completely new AMS, which when combined with firmware updates, adds some of the missing functionality, such as being able to correctly label the color and type of filament if you're not using the Bamboo Lab filament with the RFID tags. What is set and detected on the printer also translates properly through to Bamboo Studio, 
as well as the updated Bamboo Handy mobile app, both of which previously showed random filaments. In the interest of improving reliability, I was guided in adding silicon glue to help strain relief, and with their support, I've also diagnosed and identified what led to a nozzle clog and a failed print. They've been very willing to listen and improve the printer as much as possible. The printer is still not 100% of the way there, but it is getting closer every week. So how good a job did this 3D printer do for this particular project? Most of the parts were printed in carbon infused nylon. And with the sealed chamber, you can see there was absolutely zero warping or distortion. This filament has a fine matte texture and to me it looks incredible. It does a great job of masking the layer lines and all of the corners are crisp and clear. My only problem when using this filament is that some surfaces, despite the overhangs not being too steep, didn't seem to have proper part cooling. And I'll pass this on to Bamboo Lab so they can tweak the slicer profile. The red parts were done in this stunning X3D Pro Diamond Series PLA. Again, the sparkle helps to hide layer lines, and to me this is a nearly flawless print. I'm particularly happy with the gnarled effect that I put into the outer surface. The two end caps were too big to fit on the X1, so instead I printed them on the CR10 Max. And I really need to give this printer some TLC, as it received some bumps during the move. Because of this, the outer walls really didn't look that great, and I had to spend a fair amount of time sanding them down, and despite this, this has definitely diminished from the final product. I also did a little bit of cleaning up to the dodgy overhangs from the X1 parts, but not too much as I plan to reprint these later on once the slicer has been tweaked. The only other components were the carbon fibre end plates, and these were machined on the Carvera, another Kickstarter machine I've covered in the past that is actually about to ship. If you want to learn more about this machine, I've linked that video below as well. I had a pile of finished parts, so let's put this together. We start by inserting all of the captive M4 Nylock nuts, and depending on print orientation, some of them were a tighter fit than others. So for the looser ones, where there might have been a chance of it falling out, I just put a little bit of masking tape on the back of the slot to prevent this. Some of the holes had false floors to avoid support, and these needed drilling out, and with these preparation steps complete, I could put all of the pieces into place. Starting with the bottom cap, followed by the top cap, and after that, the two side panels. They were designed to slot in with the holes aligning, which means a series of M4 by 30 bolts holds a lot together on each side. The same length bolt is also used to go through the face of the side plates. All of the bolts end up either flush or concealed, and I think this gives quite a tidy appearance. To finish off, we place our two end caps into position, and these should be a snug fit because they stop any of the other parts from moving out of position. I did a final double check of the measurement for the carbon fibre tube, trimmed it down to length, and then tested that it was secure. The final parts and a real visual feature are the carbon fibre end plates. These simply rest on top before more M4 by 30mm bolts go through to attach to the captive nuts. Repeat for the other side, and that completes the assembly, which was surprisingly fast, especially considering how long it took to design and print the parts. This thing is truly heavy and enormous, especially compared to a normal power bank. But overall, I am happy with the way that it looks. So how does it perform? Let's start by flicking the power on to the twin 5V USB ports, and plugging a cable into my phone to make sure that it charges. Next up, the 12 volt socket, and I have this really bright spotlight that should be good for spotting wildlife on camping trips. Traditionally, it would be tethered to a vehicle, but now it becomes portable. And then we have this camping warmer cooler unit. It draws more current than everything I've tested so far, but the battery voltage only dropped by 0.2. Therefore, I give this one another tick. So this power bank is functional, and it should last quite a long time when off-road or camping. Visually, I'm pretty happy with it, apart from the fact that it looks so enormous. I like the combination of the matte black carbon filled nylon parts, the actual carbon fibre present, and the metallic red diamond PLA. I would still like to reprint some of the pieces, once I know what's happening with the slicer, to get the surface quality to a high standard all around. The other thing I'm not happy with is the obvious sanding marks where I had to fix up the end caps but rather than reprint those, I think I'm best printing a TPU border that goes around the outside, sliding on from the end and protecting the corners. With that, I think this power bank will be complete. <laughs> this thing is a real chunky boy, and maybe I'm biased, but I do like the appearance. It will be satisfying to use it out in the bush, 
particularly using that light to ward off drop bears. If you want to learn how to design your own projects, I am partway through a tutorial series on just that. So if you like any of the features of this power bank and you'd like them covered, please request that in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy designing your own 3D printed projects. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.